This month on The Spark, our theme is Women Leading for Social Change. We'll learn more about an organization serving as a resource for women who have experienced domestic abuse in East Shelby County, an institute taking a leadership role in providing awareness, education, and advocacy for social justice changes for the betterment of the Memphis area, and a private state-approved school for students with learning and social disabilities in grades 6 through 12. We'll also share a special moment from our Spark Awards 2019. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance is honored to serve the Memphis community for over 60 years. We've always focused on supporting our community and believe in promoting the positives, encouraging engagement, and leading by example. Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance is proud to be a presenting sponsor of The Spark. Additional funding for The Spark is provided by Euler Industries, YMCA of Memphis and the Mid-South, Marathon, United Way of the Mid-South, My Town Movers, My Town Roofing, My Town Miracles, Stuart Lloyd Cohen, Chief Motivation Officer, and by Serves. Ever been excited by a new idea? Inspired by watching someone lead by example? When we talk about creating change, we start by sharing the stories of everyday heroes who making a difference in their own way so we can learn and do the same. This truth is the power behind this show, which is focused on business and community leaders who are leading by example to give back, fuel change, create new opportunities for the Mid-South. I'm Jeremy Park, and this is The Spark. They're an organization serving as a resource for women who have experienced domestic violence in East Shelby County. We're here with the founding president and CEO of the Women's Advocacy Center, Ramona Jackson. And Ramona, let's start. This is a personal adventure for you, a personal uh, passion and journey, but give us a little background for the Women's Advocacy Center. Great, thanks, Jeremy. Well, to let you know, I practiced law for a while. I practiced family law and I was representing women who needed orders of protection. And as I was doing that work, I came to understand that there were women who really didn't know what the next step should be. Once they got that order of protection, they were really struggling to figure out how to get them basics met, basics like shelter, basics like transportation, basics like finding a job that would allow them to support their children and themselves. So I tried to find a way to step in and help them to find those resources that would enable them to live with some kind of economic independence and to live safely within the community where they had chosen to reside. It's a startling statistic, but it's one of those that I, I think needs to be brought up is that women on average, it takes seven times for something to happen before they actually leave. Talk about that aspect of this. That is a startling statistic. And when you think about what could happen every time a woman leaves and goes back, it really becomes a statistic that we want to decrease. We want to remove the barriers that prevent women from leaving an abusive relationship and help them find a way to live safely and securely in their homes. And what prevents women from leaving oftentimes is really just that fact that they don't have the finances to support themselves. They don't feel like they have a network of support in the community. Maybe they don't feel like they have anyone that they can really trust to tell about what's been happening in their lives. And so we try to come alongside them and remove those kinds of barriers and really help them find a way to feel like I can do this. I have someone who's walking with me. I have someone who's concerned about me and my children. And as a result, I can take those steps that I need to to get out of that relationship and not feel like my only option is to go back. So let's dive into the actual programs. You mentioned emergency assistance. You're in your legal background is a big piece of this too. You've got legal services, counseling, mentoring. So talk about the different indirect and direct services. Those are the services that we have found really make the most impact to these ladies. And those are services that help them to really get on their feet. So our direct services are our donation center where we keep items like household items and personal care items and items for babies and children. We like to provide those items so that women don't have to be concerned about that. They can use their financial resources for other things that they need in their lives. We also provide volunteer care coordinators. And one of the ladies that we serve, she said that this is one of the best things that we have done in our organization is to provide a mentor to walk alongside her through this transition and her recounting the relationship that she and that care coordinator have said to me that this is an area where we can do as much as we possibly can in terms of providing legal resources and counseling and providing 
uh, shelter and emergency assistance for ladies, but really having a, another person who cares about them, who walks along beside them, another person who is listening to them and encouraging them. This is one of the best things about the work that we do. And that lady said that because of that care coordinator, she really felt like we had saved her life and the life of her children. Give us an idea of what the transformation looks like on your end. So how are you kind of grading success and looking at transformation. So what does transformation mean on your end? Transformation means not just that we are helping a woman and her children to live safely and securely in the community and really helping her to begin to take those steps to, as I said earlier, gain economic independence, to learn how to form healthy relationships, to feel stable in her family and in her work, and also to really strengthen her faith. That transformation is important for that individual woman, but it's also important that we focus on community transformation. So how do we help communities understand how trauma affects a woman and her children? These adverse experiences that children have are really impactful to those children, to their brains, to their mental and emotional health, and also to their physical health as they grow into adulthood. And to bring that transformation about, we really need all members of the community to be engaged in this work. We need medical professionals. We need, we need mental health professionals. We need folks in the legal community and we need business professionals, educators to come alongside us because it's not just a women's issue. It is a public health issue. Part of your success really relies on being great at fundamentals. So what are some of those fundamentals to help? Thanks for asking. And I like to think about this principle kind of as the way I learned to play tennis, which was learning to really perform the basics well. And if you can do that, you can build a point shot after shot and you give yourself a chance to win. And this is what we really try to do with our ladies that we serve. We try to help them build on every positive event that they have. We try to help them better understand how they fit in the community. And we try to help them understand what resources are available we try to provide them with resources that are going to help them to build on those events, to build their confidence, to build their self-esteem, to really help them grow and develop in those areas where they might be lacking, to help them achieve their dreams and those things that they really want to achieve in their lives. And in that way, we give them a chance to win. We give them a chance to live the life that they want. We give them and their children a chance to live those lives. So we really try to build uh, one woman at a time, one event at a time, so that we give them a chance to live the life, as I said, that they really want to live. We'll wrap up with how we can help and where we can get in touch with you. Well, you can help by certainly donating to the work that we do. We take furniture donations. We take donations of household items and personal care items, diapers and wipes for babies. Financial support is always needed and always appreciated. And you can do that on our website at www.womensadvocacycenter.org. Or you can certainly reach out to me at 901-896-9055. That's a, a great way to reach out and we can get back in touch with you. Or you can go to our Facebook page. Well, Ramona, thank you for all you and your team doing the community. Greatly appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much, Jeremy. This was a great opportunity to let folks know about our work. I appreciate it. They're an institute taking a leadership role in providing awareness, education, and advocacy for social change. We're here with the executive director for the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change, Daphne McFerrin. And let's start with a little bit of history. So give us some history for the Hooks Institute. The Hooks Institute was created in 1996 by the late civil rights icon and Memphian, Benjamin L. Hooks, and faculty members here at the University of Memphis. The goal of the Institute is to preserve civil rights history, but also to use the scholarship, the collective scholarship of the faculty here to create change in the community that removes racial, economic, health, and other disparities. You have a number of initiatives, so let's dive in and just get going on the initiatives because you have a lot of ground to cover, including documentaries as well, but talk about Hamey and some of the initiatives that you undertake. So the Hooks Institute has, I would call it two buckets. One is the civil rights preservation part of it, and the other is the community engagement. So when we look at the preservation, we're looking at the fact that the Hooks Institute digitized the personal papers and professional papers of Benjamin Hooks. There are about 300 
80 or so boxes of his personal documents spanning his career as a lawyer, judge, and member of the FCC. Uh, we digitized that collection and that is the largest digitized, digitized collections in the history of the University of Memphis Libraries. I actually, uh, with a grant from National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, completed a collection on the Fayette County, Tennessee Civil Rights Movement. That movement started in 1959 when my father um, led a voter registration drive that resulted in many uh, African-American families being evicted from farms. Many of them were sharecroppers because they registered to vote. And that collection is here at the University of Memphis. We also do documentaries, and I hope uh, many of your viewers have seen our documentaries on WKNO. We're pleased to partner with WKNO on the broadcast, for example, of Duty of the Hour, which is a documentary on the life of Benjamin Hooks. Freedom's Frontline, Fayette County, Tennessee, which tells the movement of the civil rights movement in that county. And we have a documentary that's kind of fun that looks at the impact of the civil rights movement on music, fashion, and culture. Um, so that I would put in the preservation part of it. Now, the second bucket is community engagement. So that, what falls into that bucket is our program, the Hooks African American Male Initiative. It's a program to increase the retention and graduation rates of African-American males attending the University of Memphis. I am proud to say that in last year that ended in June, we had 57 um, male students in the program. And in the spring semester, 14 of them made the Dean's List, which we find incredible. Absolutely. The program is focused on um, employment, uh, professional skills, etiquette, uh, but we also fo focus on the young men's responsibility to be engaged with the community, to make a difference, and also to give back. Another program that we have that's community engagement are our policy papers. Now, when I say policy papers, it sounds very academic. It is and it isn't. So for example, we've had uh, writers from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis write about the mobility of boys and men of color in the United States. And unfortunately, the research so shows that even if a, an African-American male is born into a family of wealth, he is likely to fall into poverty during his lifetime. So you have to conclude from this research that there is something at play in American society, and I'll just call it what it is, racism, which keeps people of color and especially African-American men from reaching the higher tiers of American society in terms of their participation in the workforce, uh, in terms of their involvement in society in general. Oh, in the past, we have been a, a strong and strategic partner with a program called Splash Mid South. That program, we partnered with Methodist LeBonner on that. And the focus was on increasing the swimming proficiency of Hispanic and African-American children. Unfortunately, they have the highest drowning rates in the nation. And we said, we're gonna do something about that. And so over a period of time, thousands of children have gone through that program. Uh, some of them learn water safety instruction, how to be safe around water. Others learn um, how to swim proficiently and actually some have become competitive swimmers. I know that one of the other big initiatives is voter registration. So talk about voter registration. So voter registration has really been one of the central tenets of the Hooks Institute's work, especially on campus. Uh, voter registration is especially personally important to me because of my personal history and my father and mother's involvement in voter registration in Fayette County in the 50s and 60s. So the Hooks Institute has worked with a number of student organizations on campus, specifically the Student Government Association, to make sure that our students are registered to vote. Uh, and our students here at the University of Memphis are from all over the country, but that doesn't prevent them from registering in the jurisdictions for which uh, where they are residents. So for example, in 2018, the Hooks Institute partnered with SGA and we actually won the, the statewide contest um, working with the SGA, the SGA won it, but we were a partner in this in registering the, uh, the largest number of students on a University of Memphis campus. We have had, to, we worked with the election commission and had uh, voter registration machines here so that students can practice on them. And we've even registered adults who were newly naturalized here at the Rose Theater. They had undergone the naturalization ceremony. And it was important to see that these were new American citizens uh, and how much that event of the naturalization ceremony meant to them. And it was very uh, satisfying for the Hooks Institute 
and for the Haney students who worked with us to help register those newly naturalized citizens as they exit, exited out of Rose Theater. So that was very gratifying and very important uh, for the maintenance of democracy, for emphasizing to both students and those we interact with of the significance of voting, and also that this is a country where the population um, supports democracy through making sure that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and civil and human rights. Talk about how we can help and just some of the lessons, as you mentioned, when you talk about advocacy and creating change, how can we help and be a part of what you're doing? So in this moment, I call this a disruptive moment in time. Um, the George Floyd murder, the recent um, killing in Wisconsin, uh, it is such a disruptive moment in time um, that organizations like the Hooks Institute, we're, we always work on these issues, but in this moment, our work is even more critical. And while we have a long track record of working towards civil rights and social justice, we see that the need is not lessening, it's increasing. And we need the support of the public and donations from the public and attendance at our events by the public and the moral support of the public to make to help the staff in our efforts to bring the best quality program we can to the community. Well, Daphne, greatly appreciate all you and your team do. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The Spark Awards annually recognize and celebrate individuals and organizations that have made outstanding contributions to the community. This year's recipient of the nonprofit award with a budget greater than $5 million is Agape Child and Family Services. Agape Child and Family Services. We are 50 years old this year, which is amazing. Agape is a faith-based organization that has served deeply in this community. Uh, our focus is poverty reduction, is to fight poverty at all its levels, including systemic. So we're working deeply in communities where people live, going to all the places that they go, serving everyone in their household in this two-generation holistic poverty reduction model to fight poverty in its fullness at a community level, at a systemic level, and with many partners. Kind of the dirty little fact is, only about 5% of our families, our neighbors that live in dire poverty here in Memphis ever escape poverty. And so 12 years ago, we said we will no longer raise any dollars that does not focus directly on what communities say are our strengths and what are the barriers standing in the way. We're specifically in apartments in the surrounding area. So I have 130 staff embedded in those communities. And so if you are a child birth to five years of age, we're focused on not only your social emotional development, but being ready to go to kindergarten. If you're a child or children in that home that's kindergarten to 12th grade, we're in all the schools that our kids go to from the three communities that we live in, addressing life matters that are impacting them academically. We have a focus around workforce development and jobs, and I have staff working with the chamber, working with WIN, helping them get to not just a job, but to career. So $15 an hour or more, and we're evaluating and measuring all these places looking at housing and so homeless families, families fleeing out of, out of domestic violence, becoming homeless, providing housing within apartments in these surrounding areas, holistically wrapping around. And then we have churches in the center and as a faith-based organization upon people's volition, their choice, if they want uh, hope through churches and those communities of faith, then, then we're in the center doing that. To see homeless families, uh, moms and children, who flee out of domestic violence and all that that means. When she is given a key to her own apartment, walks in, says, this is mine. I feel the love from some stranger. And to go from that point to a place of saying, I now have not only a key, but I have a job. My kids are where I want them to be. They have safety. It may still be really, really hard, but I now have control of my life and our life. And I can see that there is a tomorrow. That gives a lot of joy to be able to see that. I've got a great team. I've got a great staff. We've got a thousand volunteers. I have over a hundred partners. I have a board of directors that is just trusting and trustworthy. We have donors. At the very core, to know that you're doing something that is building community. And it's, uh, it's something innate within all of us in our heart and our desire. It brings about good and goodness. It's bigger than us. 
That drives me every day. They're a private school for students with learning and social disabilities. We're here with the executive director of Concord Academy, Cece Palazzola, and it starts with parents who want more for their children. So give us some background on Concord Academy. That's right, Jeremy. So we were founded in 1983 by a group of concerned parents who felt like they were not getting what they needed for their children in a traditional school environment. So they decided to found uh, the school and they were able to, uh, you know, really make a small, very uh, structured environment that is supportive of the learning needs that our students have. So your grades six through 12, talk about some of the things that make you all different in terms of small classroom sizes and the teachers, the expertise. So dive in deep on what makes it successful. Sure. So what, of course, one thing is our very small size. Um, our class sizes are also very small. So our teacher to student ratio is quite small. Um, so we also have sort of a three pronged approach. So we have, um, uh, we have academics, of course, like any traditional school. We also have social emotional learning for our students. A lot of our students need a little extra help with social interactions or anxiety or some other issue like that. So that's sort of a, a, the second prong. And then the third is um, a, what we call transition services. Basically what that means is that we are getting them ready for um, life after Concord or life after high school. And that might look different for various students. It's very individualized and just suits whatever their needs are when they leave us. Talk about your teachers because I think this is something that does separate you out is the training and the expertise of your teachers. Right, so we have an entire staff of teachers that are trained and certified in special education. This is quite unique, I would say, um, and they, um, they all have a Tennessee teaching license that has an endorsement in special ed. The other thing is, and you kind of alluded to it, but is vocation. Vocational training is a part of preparing them. And so talk about vocation and also two things like internships. Exactly. So every high school student at Concord has a transition plan. We start at ninth grade and go on up to 12th and they actually have a transition class where they are learning things, you know, just like a regular curriculum, uh, like learning the soft skills that you might need to get a job, learning to write a resume, learning on the job skills or pre-job skills. Then in their senior year, they actually go out into the community and do internships. We have quite a few community partners that we work with for that so that we're able to match the students up with something that they like, something that is sort of along their career path or able to help them in some way. And sure. they also, uh, those community partners come to our campus and do mock interviews before the internship process begins. Well, that's what I was say is share how we can help because one of the ways is to be able to go in and do mock interviews and internships. And so there's a number of ways that we can help. Talk about some of those ways. Absolutely. So uh, we, we are always engaging community partners. We, as I said, we have quite a few, but we're always looking for community partners that want to help kids that might be a little different. And that might look like um, we have kids that go out to restaurants, out to um, furniture stores, uh, you know, just, just, you know, everyday businesses. It doesn't matter, you know, what type of business you own or you work for or you run. Um, we would love to talk to you about how our students might engage or how uh, there might be a fit with one of our students because our students are so unique. Um, you know, we might have a student that's interested in radio and television, or we might have a student that's interested in uh, fixing car engines and, you know, it, anything and everything in between. Talk about success on your end, because as you mentioned, it's all individualized. And so each student has their own pathway to success. 
but a big part of that is, is that as they become more successful, they become more confident and they're able to take on more. And it really creates this ripple effect that breaks down stereotypes and is able to transform our community in a larger way. So talk about success and that ripple effect that's created in the community. Absolutely. So one of the things that we start with is building confidence, uh, you know, inside the walls of Concord. A lot of our students have come from schools or environments where um, they weren't successful or they shut down. And so part of our job is trying to get them to re-engage and really build that confidence uh, to the point that then they can, you know, build upon that even more and get to the point where they are able to do something, you know, when they leave us. So uh, for some kids that might be a four-year college, uh, we've had kids go to CDU and other four-year programs. It might be a program like Tiger Life, which is sort of a para-college two-year program that is also focused on uh, vocational needs or, you know, anything and everything in between. They might go straight into an employment situation but uh, it's all about really finding out what that child has a proclivity for, what they have, what they get excited about, you know, what, what they want to do with their life, basically, which is what every high schooler <laughs> is, you know, supposed to be doing, right? So go ahead and wrap up and talk about how we can reach out. Where do we go? Website, social media, phone number. Where do we go to learn more? Right, so we are at concord-academy.org. Our phone number is 901-682-3115. And we are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Well, Cece, thank you for all you and your team do. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Jeremy. As we saw in this month's episode, we're blessed here in the Mid-South with women who are not only leading their organizations, but leading for social change here in our community and beyond. Ramona Jackson is using her experience and expertise to help women who have experienced domestic abuse in East Shelby County by providing direct and indirect services, including legal advice and counsel, mentoring, financial assistance, emergency housing, and so much more. Daphne McFerrin and the Benjamin L. Hooks Institute for Social Change is researching and teaching the history of the civil rights movements, producing documentaries, and leading initiatives to activate and create change. And Cece Palazzola and Concord Academy are offering students a unique learning community with an atmosphere of respect and acceptance, where students can achieve at their highest levels and become leaders who create further change in our community. Thank you to all of the women here in the community who serve and lead, empower the good, and thank you for watching The Spark. To learn more about each of the guests, to watch past episodes, and to share your stories of others leading by example, visit wkno.org and click on the link for The Spark. We look forward to seeing you next month, and we hope that you'll continue joining with us to create a spark for the Mid-South. Stay safe. Lipscomb & Pitts Insurance is honored to serve the Memphis community for over 60 years. We've always focused on supporting our community and believe in promoting the positives, encouraging engagement, and leading by example. Lipscomb & Pitts Insurance is proud to be a presenting sponsor of The Spark.